Good morning again. My name is Travis. I'm one of the pastors here, and I have been married uh, for about a decade, maybe give or take a year, I'm not sure. Uh, it's a decade. Anyway, um, my wife, uh, her name is Kim, and when she was pregnant with our first child, uh, she was probably in her second trimester, and my wife loves to take baths. That's how she unwinds, that's how she, how she relaxes. And so one time during her second trimester, this is an important part of the story, she's running the water for her bath, and I go in there to tell her something. And when I go in, I notice that the tub is really full. And so I'm thinking in my, my Neanderthal brain that when somebody gets in there, the water will just rush out. And so what I tried to say was, honey, do you think that the tub is a little full? What came out of my mouth was, baby, are you sure you're going to fit in there? <laughs> the amazing part of the story is that I'm still alive. <laughs> I'm still breathing. And she went on to have another child with me. It's pretty amazing. I realize now, she was super gracious. She responded very kindly. I realize now that she is also the one who recommended I tell this story and that revenge is best served cold. <laughs> so she has finally paid me back. But we have all said something that was just stupid. That you wish, even if it, as it's coming out of your mouth, you're like, oh no, come back, get, no, nope, there it goes, can't get it back. There are things that are just stupid and people laugh at you and forgive you for it. There are things that are hurtful. There are things that wound and are, deal ongoing wound as if poison. There are things that we wish we could unsay. There are some things that we didn't say that we wish we could. We all need to know how to be wiser in our words. We all need to know how wisdom can affect the speech that we give. We are in Proverbs as a study and last week we talked about friendship. This week we're going to be talking about, obviously, the power of words, the, the importance of words, and how to be wise in our speech. And I can't think of anything more connected than friendship and the ability to speak well to one another. So we are in Proverbs chapter 15. And we're going to be looking at a few verses in that. But we're going to be looking at three things that wise speech does for us. Three things that wise speech does. And the first one is that wise words give life. Wise words give life. Verse 1, chapter 15, a soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. The tongue of the wise commends knowledge, but the mouths of fools pour out folly. The eyes of the Lord are in every place, keeping watch on the evil and the good. A gentle tongue is a tree of life, but perverseness in it breaks the spirit. One of the most prevalent subjects in all of Scripture is the destructive capability of the spoken word. You see it in Genesis 3. God's good creation is ruined by the serpent speaking lies and deception to Adam and Eve. You see it in Genesis 11. The people get together and because of their ability to communicate, they try to supplant God as the ruler of all things and he confuses their speech at the Tower of Babel. In Exodus... Pharaoh says repeatedly, I will not let the Israelites go, and he subjects them to slavery. In 1 Kings 12, Rehoboam, who is the son of King Solomon, he destroys the kingdom with an ill-timed word. In the Gospels, people yell out, crucify him. Peter denies Jesus with his words. Judas agrees to betray Jesus with his words. Pilate convicts Jesus with his words. And in the New Testament, apostasy, the verbal denial of the faith, is a rampant problem in fear. We are a verbal people. Every single thing that we have accomplished as a species is capable of the ability that we have because we are able to communicate complex ideas in order that we can coordinate and work together. That sentence was also very ironic because it was a complicated idea that I struggled to communicate. <laughs> Every one of us knows the value of a wise word said at the right time. And everybody knows the destructive capability of an ill-timed word at the wrong time. 
And because we live in a fallen world, because we live in a place where, where sin has permeated every single faculty that we have, it should be no surprise that our speech can be so lethal. Our speech can be so destructive. Most of the conflict that we have, and we're going to be talking about conflict next week, most of the conflict that we have with others usually starts in a place of speech. It starts with somebody saying something. And so it makes sense that the Proverbs would spend time talking about words and talking about their importance and talking about how we, they affect our life. But what's interesting about the Proverbs, that some of them deal with thinking about what you say before you say it. But a lot of them actually deal with healing the damage done by your words with other words. And I think that's fascinating. It's almost as if the Proverbs takes for granted the human condition. It's like, yeah, that's a given. Let's talk about how to heal the damage. And so there are four things mentioned in these four verses that are life-giving ways to use your words. And the first is kind words. Kind words are life-giving. Verse 1, a soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. Often healing needs to take place when somebody is angry with us. It's one of the ways we need it. Right? And so in 14, Proverbs 14.35, which is the verse right before this, the king is angry with his subordinate. And so much of our frustration, most of our conflict can take place between people who are in a higher position and a lower position. There's that vying for dominance, superiority in a situation, and it can lead to anger. It can lead to friction. And so if you're angry with somebody, it says here, a gentle word turns away wrath. Most of us think that that is somebody else is mad with us. But what about a gentle word when you're angry with someone else? What if you're the one that says the gentle word, even though you're the one who's angry, even though you're the one who has every right to be angry, and not the gentle word through clenched teeth, but the gentle word? There are a few things more amazing, more powerful than the gentle word at the right time. You see, we often fall into a habit of escalating situations. Somebody says something, then we say something, then they say something, then we say something. The wise person is someone who de-escalates. They go gentler and gentler and gentler, which is also kind of frustrating for people that like to argue. So you can have fun with that. But even look at Jesus. Jesus is in constant conflict with the religious authorities. And very rarely does he actually display his anger You can kind of set aside the turning over tables in the temple. That's a different thing. But in in verbal sparring with them, he doesn't lose his cool. He's constantly de-escalating situations. Kind words are life-giving words, especially in deserts where kind words are needed. Words of commendation are also life-giving words. Verse 2, the tongue of the wise commends knowledge, but the mouths of fools pour out folly. Knowledge, this word knowledge, the idea of commending knowledge to people is this idea of truth. We often think if we're going to be gentle, we can't speak the truth. And if we're going to be truthful, we can't be gentle. And that's not a mutually exclusive idea that the Bible presents to us. On the contrary, the Bible encourages us to commend the truth, commend truth to other people through the adorning of our words. That's what the word commend means. It means to doll them up. It means to make it look better. And some of us are really gifted in this, and I don't mean it in a manipulative kind of way. I mean it in you're able to take hard things and make them sound really good to hear. There are some of you who your criticism can sound so good and can sound so welcoming that I would almost rather have the, I would rather have the criticism than I would have even somebody just being nice. And then there's others of us who take a lot of pride in our ability to tell it like it is. I'm just going to tell it like it is. I don't know that that's a commendable quality. I think you need to be careful if you enjoy telling it like it is. If you won't take the time or the energy to adorn your truth as you deliver it. Maybe you need to count on somebody else to deliver that truth in your stead. It's a dangerous thing. Words of commendation can be life-giving if we're willing to take the time to, to make the truth palatable, right? 
Unspoken words can also be life-giving or the opposite. Verse 3, the eyes of the Lord are in every place, keeping watch on the evil and the good. Now, it seems like the Proverbs completely divert from the subject of speaking. But in the context of the passage, it makes a lot of sense. Since we're talking about speaking, this is talking about the fact that God knows every single word that you speak and that you choose not to speak. Much of our communication is done non-verbally, so that's part of this. But also, we say a lot of words. I think the average, I looked it up this week, I think the average woman speaks 11,000 words a day, and I think the average man's like five. I don't know, you look it up. But if. If we want to split the difference and say the average person speaks about 8,000 words a day, think about how many words you don't say. It's got to be well over 16, 20,000 words you say to yourself that you choose not to say, that you let roll around in the deep parts of your heart. God knows those. What's more is when you have that quiet argument in the car with somebody that's not there because you're just trying to get it out of your system or you have that argument in the shower, again, with no one else, God knows that argument as well. God knows and sees the deep parts of our lives. And and our thought is, oh, I need to be careful with what I say. And you do. But here's the problem. Unspoken words can be just as damaging as spoken words. One, it can be the kind word, the loving word, the the word of approval that you refuse to give. That's destructive. But it can also be other words. If you allow yourself to ruminate, meditate on certain ideas, certain concepts, things you've seen on TV, seen things that you've read in books, things that you allow yourself to think, I don't like that person, but I'm going to act nice. That, That seed of frustration germinates into anger and into bitterness. If it's left unchecked, your words, spoken or unspoken, change you. And they will change the world around you. And so we have to concentrate on speaking truth. We have to commend truth to ourselves. We have to adorn it to ourselves. Paul David Tripp says, no one is more influential in your life than you are because no one talks to you more than you do. He goes on to talk about meditation and how you reflect on things and how that shapes you. The more you contemplate something, the more it will shape you. This means that we have got to commend the gospel to ourselves. Got to reflect on the fact that Christ died for us. Reflect on the fact that God loves us so much, that he sacrificed so much to have us. That he knows the depth of us, he knows the darkest parts of us, and he still loves us. And if you reflect on that, if you can meditate on that, it probably will change the way you talk to other people because guess what will happen? You'll start to realize that, yeah, I'm broken and I'm a sinner just like everybody else is. And you might be more forgiving. You might be more willing to forgive some perceived slights that have gone your way. So unspoken words are life-giving. Lastly, wholesome words are life-giving as well. Verse 4, a gentle tongue is a tree of life, but perverseness in it breaks the spirit. The tree of life there is a reference back to the garden, and it's also a reference ahead to the tree of life in the new heaven and the new earth. Your words are capable of giving life. They're capable of giving peace to people. You must use your words to bring wholeness. And we underestimate the damage that our words can do, the offhand joke, the perverse comment, the, just the unthought of thing. I, I said two things this morning. Before I even like really got here, it was like eight o'clock and it was like 8.15. I had said two things that I was like, man, I wish I hadn't said that. So I was off to a really great start for this sermon. Your words can bring brokenness, but it can also bring wholeness. The Hebrew word for peace is shalom. Many of you probably know that. It does mean peace, but can also mean wholeness. You're supposed to be ministers of peace, people that bring wholeness where they are. Our words, the words we speak to other people. Look at what Jesus does. Look at how Jesus speaks. Usually when he does a healing, when he, when he does a miracle, he speaks. He doesn't have to, but he does. When he calms the storm, he says, be uh, peace, be still. When he, when he uh, uh, heals somebody, he says, go, be well, or, or go and sin no more. 
He says to Lazarus, Lazarus, come out. Even when he feeds the 5,000, he blesses the bread. He speaks over it. Your words, although not as powerful as the Lord's, have power in them. That's one of the ways we bear the image of God. He speaks things into existence that didn't exist before. We speak things into existence too. We don't do it out of nothing. But you have the power to speak incredible things into the lives of other people, both for good and for ill. It's the power of the word. And what happens when we do this, how we use our words shows something else about us. And this is our second point. Wise words reveal a wise heart. Wise words reveal a wise heart. Look at verse 7. The lips of the wise spread knowledge, not so the hearts of fools, which implies that the hearts of fools are spreading not knowledge, not wisdom, but pain, brokenness. One of the hallmarks of Hebrew poetry is this thing called parallelism. And parallelism is this idea that the second line of a couplet uh, explains and amplifies the, what the truth of the first line. So it's said a little bit differently. Now, this is not a strict parallelism. In fact, it's probably not classified one at all. But it is important to see the kind of poetic vibe that's going on here, connecting the lips in the first line to the heart in the second line. The writer of this proverb is implying that there is a connection between what goes on here and what comes out here, which all of you who've been in church for five minutes are like, well, yeah, we know Jesus said, out of the heart, the mouth speaks. He made it explicit. But the writer of Proverbs is pointing to this way, way before Christ spoke it. Foolish people reveal their foolishness by speaking. Wise people reveal their wisdom by speaking and often by choosing not to speak. What you say will either spread knowledge and wisdom or it will spread something else. It will spread brokenness, it will spread hurt, and it will spread pain. And you shouldn't be surprised at the brokenness that comes out of people's mouths because broken words come from a broken heart. Broken words come from a broken heart. The broken word is symptomatic of a broken heart. If you were to go to the beach and you were to set out your chair and you're sitting there watching everything and you were to see a fin sticking up out of the water, a shark fin, you'd be terrified, you'd be scared, you'd be worried, right? But the fin by itself is not dangerous. It's a little rough, it feels like sandpaper. If you rub up against it too much, I guess you could lose like the first layer of your skin. But the, the dorsal fin of the shark is not a dangerous thing. It's what's attached to it. It's what's beneath the waves that is so lethal. And in the same way, words that come out of your mouth can be damaging to some and not damaging to others. It's not the words, it's the heart behind the words. If somebody came up to me after this service and I didn't know you, and you told me I don't like you. One, bold move. But it probably wouldn't affect me too much. I'd probably be like, why, why not? Did I say something? Can I, you know, can we, can we work on this? Um, bitterness, we can, we can work on this together. But if like one of you that I knew, like if Stephen were to come up to me and say, Travis, I really don't like you. I couldn't take him, he's obviously stronger than me. But it would hurt. It would hurt my feelings. I'd be devastated. Again, it's the heart behind the words, not the words themselves that do such damage, such brokenness. And every single one of us have brokenness in our hearts. You have to see that. Some of us have brokenness in our hearts and we, we ascribe it to our parents or to a past experience and it's this thing that we carry around us. When we were young, our heart just got shattered and the rest of our life has been about picking up those pieces. Some of us have broken hearts because somebody left and they didn't come back. Or somebody was lost. Or a vision of your future that you wanted never materialized. And you have a broken heart. Others, we have a more generalized hurt. We're not okay and sometimes we can't put a finger on why we're not okay. But all of us have hurt. All of us have brokenness. And when we are weakest, when we're worn down, when we're tired, that brokenness comes out in the way that we speak to each other. We lash out. And what we do, because we're, we're good uh, North Dallas uh, Christians, is rather than owning our brokenness a lot of times, you know what we do? We cover it up. We cover it up. We hide behind our nice house. We hide behind our nice car, our nice clothes. We hide behind a smile. 
We hide behind our profession. We hide behind talking about football or baseball, whatever. And we hide our brokenness. And what this does is we fake it until we make it. We hide our brokenness because we, we were trying to do it, I think, from a good place. I don't want to lash out at anybody. I don't want to burden anybody with my stuff. But what it does is it creates a little bit of a culture of hypocrisy. Because what the world outside sees is a bunch of people who don't think that anything's wrong. Hypocrites are people who know the truth, right, but don't do it. The problem is whatever's in your heart is going to come out. And our failure to, our, our resistance to actually owning our brokenness, of recognizing our brokenness, actually dealing with it, is one of the reasons why our voice in the culture around us has become so weak. It's because the world doesn't think they have anything to learn from a group of people who seem so disconnected with their own hearts. We act a lot of the time like we've got it all together rather than broken sinners who need forgiveness. We seem disconnected. But here again, we have the Proverbs, verse 7, the lips of the wise spread knowledge, not so the hearts of fools, helping us navigate this gray area of life. One of the only ways to get really treated poorly in our society is to say the wrong thing. You put something out there on social media, you say the wrong thing, and, and it can come back to bite you, right? How many people uh, do you know, maybe they're in your family, where Uncle Bob came to Thanksgiving one year, expressed an opinion that wasn't really welcome, and nobody's seen Uncle Bob since. <laughs> he hasn't been invited back, because, well, it's just really offensive. Some of you have had pastors in your life, either here or somewhere else, and they expressed an opinion that you didn't agree with, that you didn't like. Guess what? I speak 30 minutes once a week. I'm going to say something that you don't like and disagree with. That's a part of the brokenness of the world. That's a part of the nature of this communication style. I don't have uh, the opportunity to know each of you and to nuance what we say and, and to have a discussion about it, right? That's the nature of what this is. I hope that this group does not write people off because they express an opinion that's maybe not nuanced or massaged just the right way. Don't write people off just because they said something that you disagree with. And I will say this to, to back off that a little bit. One of the things I love about this place is on the whole, you're one of the most encouraging group of people that I know. I can't count the number of times that people have come up to me and offered encouragement and great love and affection. That's what I love about this place. Let's continue that. Let's keep that up. I keep coming back to this idea of empathy. I don't know if I've been hanging out with Jeff a lot. That's like his thing, right? I'm less empathetic than Jeff is. Most of us are. But Jeff is a very empathetic person. He talks about it a lot, and I've learned a lot by watching him. And empathy is this thing that, that can really help you tailor what you say, help you commend the truth to other people. You may not agree with what somebody says, but you can at least empathize with the difficulty of the decision that they came to, right? If somebody says, oh man, I've, I've chosen to do this with my life. And you're like, you know what? Like, I maybe wouldn't have come to the same conclusion, but I can understand how you would struggle there. I can, I can, I can see myself maybe making that decision under the right circumstances. Just a little bit of empathy. It buys you a great platform to then speak and say, I probably would have done this differently but I love you regardless. Your words show what's in your heart. That's the truth. Wise words show what's in our heart. And because of that, words become really powerful because most of us instinctively know that words come from the heart, that there's truth in pretty much everything. So wise words are incredibly powerful. They're incredibly powerful things. Look at verse 23. It says, to make an apt answer is a joy to man and a word in season, how good it is. So one of the things that I love, and some of you in here will, will join me in this, who loves trivia? Get your hands up, it's okay. I love trivia, love it. Trivial Pursuit, awesome, love it. Uh, anybody played Sporkle? Anybody been on Sporkle's website? 
It's a website full of quizzes. I've just ruined 400 hours of your life, but it's worth it. You can find quizzes on anything. They're all user-made. You just go to town and they get verified so you know it's right. I love trivia. And you know what my favorite part about trivia is? Because if you're good at it, you hear very often the three most blessed words in the English language. You are right. Oh, I love it. It's like a drug. Just keep it coming. Ooh, I love being told I'm right. It's amazing. We all like to be right. We love being right. And that's what the apt answer here is in verse 23. The apt answer isn't just having the right answer. It's the right answer at the right time. It's the ability to go to the toolbox when something's broken and you're like, I know exactly what will fix that. And you get it right the first time. It's the ability to look at a cookbook and be like, yeah, I think I can make that. I've never made this before. And then you nail it the first time. And and everybody's like, this is amazing. How many times did you make it? And you're like, once. The apt answer is the right answer for the right situation. It's saying I nailed it. And so many of us rush to the right answer. We want to have the apt answer. But verse 28 cautions us. It says, the heart of the righteous ponders how to answer, but the mouth of the wicked pours out evil things. So the the Proverbs are cautioning us, yes, the right answer at the right time is a good thing, but don't be in such a rush to have the right answer that you forget to think through the damage, the consequences that your answer can have. You've got to be careful. The wise person won't just choose things as an ends to a means, as a righteous person, right? So let me ask you this. If we love being right, and again, who doesn't, what does it feel like to be wrong? If being right, if having an apt answer is a joy, if a word in season is good, what does it mean when we fail? How does that feel? Being wrong stinks. I hate being wrong. I, I, I don't mind being wrong as much if I'm not sure about something. Like, you know, when you're like, I think that actor played in this, and then your friend looks it up on IMDb, and they're like, no, nah, you're wrong. I'm like, meh, okay. Some of you are like, no, I, IMDb is wrong. The internet is all wrong. I know what I'm talking about. Nicolas Cage was in that. If you guess Nicolas Cage, he probably was in that. He's just been in that many movies. But when I get really irritated is when I'm convinced that I'm right. When I'm convinced that I'm right. And some of us live our entire lives convinced we're right about something. And you find out you're wrong. This is in many things. Discoveries we haven't made yet. Most of human existence, they've lived with the idea that the, the planet Earth is in the middle of the, of the galaxy, middle of the universe. Hasn't been that long that we we're like, no, it's not, not that way. It stands to reason that we could have that in other ways too, right? Now, I know what you're going to say. You're going to say, you're going to think that I'm going to say, Travis, it's okay. Like, everybody's wrong sometime. No, 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 no. I'm actually going to lean the other way. What if, what if the, we have the apt answer so much less than we think we do? What if you are wrong way more than you think you are right? What if I were to tell you that most of us, that all of us, miss the mark way more than we think we do. Because what the Proverbs are telling us here is that our words are supposed to do one thing. The apt answer as a human being, your words are supposed to do one thing, give God glory. That is what your voice is for. Every utterance, every idea, spoken, unspoken, doesn't matter. It's supposed to give God glory. The apt answer is the glorification of God. And what we do is instead we glorify ourselves, we glorify one another, we glorify our sports teams, our possessions, our businesses. That's what we glorify. The apt answer is always the majesty and the glory of God, because, but because we are full of brokenness and sin, it is impossible for us to meet that standard. Look again at verse 23. Or sorry, verse 28. The heart of the righteous ponders how to answer. Well, we have a problem right away. Because if you read Romans, you know there's a problem. Romans 3.10 says what? No one is righteous, not even one. We are wrong. And we're not just wrong a little, we're wrong a lot. And we're not just wrong sometimes, we're wrong all the time. And we're not just wrong on the surface with what we say, we are wrong to the very depths of our heart. 
And is there a word that can fix that? What can you say? What can I say to you that's going to fix that? Travis, how are you going to alleviate this? You're really coming down on us. There is a word. John 1. In the beginning was the word. And the word was God. And the word was with God. It was with God. He was with God in the beginning. God speaks. The word becomes flesh. The word is the son of God and his name is Jesus. It is only the incarnate Jesus that has the life-giving words we need because he is the life-giving word. He's the only one who's gentle. He's the only one who's all the way down deep is pure and wholesome in his speech and in his heart. There's no disconnect between the heart and the mouth like with us. He's the only one wise in heart and he's the only one that has the words powerful enough to heal us. It should be no surprise that the one who created us is also the one capable of restoring us and he does it through words. Think about it. Creation. How does he create? He speaks. How many days does he create? Seven. And then he goes to the cross. And Jesus is on the cross. And what does Jesus do? Does he just sit up there? No, he speaks. And how many things does he say? Seven. He says, forgive them for they do not know what they do. He says, today you shall be with me in paradise. He says, woman, behold your son. Son, behold your mother. He says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He says, I thirst. He says, it is finished. He says, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. These words may not be it exactly, but in Genesis he says, let there be light. Here he says, let there be salvation. Let there be restoration. Let there be healing. Let evil not win. These are the words of recreation. These are the words of restoration. And remember, in the, we started in Genesis, all these destructive words, boom, 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 boom. But you notice in the Gospels, there's a change. Now the words aren't destructive, they're healing, and they're becoming more and more healing. And then guess what happens? How does the Gospel get to other places? We proclaim it, we say it, we speak it. And all of a sudden, these words go everywhere. The death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ is everywhere. And guess what? If you want to have life-giving words, you will not have them apart from Christ. You'll continue to have wrong words, wrong answers, broken hearts. But if you come to Christ, if you turn to him, if you give him your life, he has all the words you'll need. And if you don't know how to respond to a situation, maybe you're facing something this week, I don't know how to say it. I don't know what to do there. I'm facing one right now in my own life. Guess what? You don't sit there and worry about what you're going to say. You say to yourself, I'm going to go to the Lord. I'm going to go to the Word Himself because He's the only one who has the words of life. That's what the disciples say. They say, Where else are we to go? You're the one with the words of life. Why do we think we can find them anywhere else? Go to Him, get His Word for your life, and then speak. And watch as he transforms your heart and he transforms the hearts of those around you. Let's pray. Gracious God, you are so good to us because you have spoken. And you didn't just speak us into existence. You spoke us into existence and then you spoke us into salvation. And I pray that this day your word would speak into the hearts of those in this room that may not know you. I pray that new life would begin there, second life, second birth. I pray that for those of us who do know you, Lord, we would come back again to that well again and again and again, not speaking our own words. As you said, you don't speak your own words. You speak the words of the Father. May we speak those words too. And may life flow forth from us into a broken world that needs life-giving words. Transform us, O Lord. It's in your name we pray. Amen.